Hello, everyone, and welcome to Diversity Matters, where we explore all things diversity, equity, and inclusion related. I'm your host, Oscar Holmes IV, and I'm so excited to welcome our wonderful guest, Dr. Dolly Chu, to the guest chair today as we talk about how to eliminate bias and discrimination in organizations. Dolly is an award-winning tenured professor at the New York University Stern School of Business. She studies implicit bias and unintentional unethical behavior and writes a monthly column about diversity, inclusion, and bias for Forbes.com. Today, I look forward to talking to her about the content of her first book, The Person You Mean to Be, How Good People Fight Bias, which came out in September 2018. Dr. Dolly Chug, welcome to Diversity Matters. Oh, thank you for having me, Oscar. This is exciting. We'll be back after a quick word from our sponsors. FrontrunnerNewJersey.com is a news and information blog highlighting African-American culture and leadership in South Jersey. It seeks to spotlight outstanding individuals and events in the Black community often missed by the mainstream media. Check us out at FrontrunnerNewJersey.com today. FRNJ is brought to you by AC Joseph Media, a multimedia public relations company. You can find us on the FRNJ site. So Dolly and I have known each other for several years now, as I have been quite fortunate to have been invited into academic spaces where our circles often overlapped and intermingled. I'm a huge admirer of Dolly's work, use it often in my own research, and assign some of her work to my own business students at Rutgers School of Business Camden. So I was ecstatic when I found out Dolly was working on a book and could not wait until it came out. In fact, I pre-ordered it before the release date. And after reading it, it was everything I knew that it would be. And quite frankly, it's the book that I wish I had written. So as I thought about what my goals were for this podcast, I knew I wanted Dolly to be one of my inaugural guests, and I'm so thankful that she agreed. So Dolly, let's get started. Oh, thank you, Oscar. That was so nice. And I have been waiting for you to have a podcast, and I can't wait for the book you'll write someday. So this is really exciting. Well, thank you so much. So you've published your research in nearly all of our top tier outlets. Why did you decide to write this book? the person you mean to be. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the journey from the idea phase to the actual published book? What was all of that like? Yeah. Well, you know, I think I'm just a big book fan, like fan girl authors and books ever since I was a little girl. So it's always been a dream to contribute to the world of books in some way. But as researchers, as you know, we publish in peer-reviewed journals, and Mm -hmm. we do work that other scholars can consume and build on and create sort of additional knowledge based on what the work we do. It's incremental, Mm -hmm. but we don't speak to general audiences as much. And so the process for me was, quite frankly, waiting until I got tenure, which in academia means that we've sort of proven ourselves as able to publish those peer-reviewed articles and now can think about different audiences, such as writing a general audience book. So the process was one that was sort of a seed was planted as a child, kind of just kept trying to water that seed. And eventually I was, my goal was to write a book by the time I was 50. And literally it went, it started printing in the HarperCollins printing factory the week after I turned 50. Wow. What a way to check a huge goal. <laughs> Just under the wire. Actually, not under the wire, after the wire. <laughs> but you, at least you get to check a huge goal off your list, right? I know. I know. It really was a dream come true, both because I, I really enjoyed the process of writing the book, which to me was a process of learning, and then the process of engaging with readers in sort of community around the learnings. So I love a lot of things about your book, but one of the biggest things I love about it is because there's a lot of different ways to write a book. And you could have written a soundly academic write book, but you could also write a book that's general to the public, but it's filled with academic content and you chose to do the latter. Right. So I imagine you specifically wanted this book to not just, again, speak to academics, but to speak to the general public. So I really enjoyed that about your book. Thank you. I did too. To me, I viewed it as just the written form of teaching. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm teaching in a classroom, I'm not teaching to PhD students and scholars. I teach to undergraduates or MBA students. And to me, this was just another form of teaching to people who aren't necessarily academics, but are doing it through the page as opposed to through the classroom or the Zoom these days. 
Yeah, yeah. I actually love that analogy, mm -hmm. writing the book as teaching to people. Yeah. So one of the phrases that I love from your book is the idea of being a goodish person. Mm -hmm. So explain to us what you mean by that. Yeah. Well, I think it comes from a place of frustration with myself, honestly. Like, you know, I was raised in a home where it was emphasize, you know, be a good person and do the right thing. And I would try to do that. And time and time again, I would notice myself doing things like, why, why did I just cut that person off in traffic? Or, you know, <laughs> why am I hoarding supplies during a pandemic? Like you see behaviors in yourself, or I see behaviors in myself that if I saw someone else do, I would not think that was a very like good person, frankly. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of, those were the thoughts swimming through my head before I became an academic and had like the tools and methods of research to study those questions. And then once I had the tools and methods of research and I was able to access other people's research, I realized, well, this whole good person thing where you're just like perfect all the time and like morally unbounded, you just have like perfection in your, your ethical character that's a myth. I mean, it's like unicorns. It's not going to happen. There's right. all the social science, all the psychology suggests that we have blind spots. We make mistakes. We justify our own behavior, even when we don't justify it in others. And so I felt like that left us in this terrible bind of either I'm a good person or I'm not. It's just either or like that just seems untenable as well. Isn't there? Mm -hmm. If the reality is that none of us are as good as we think we are, but we can get better, then what's the word for that? And for me, that, that word was goodish. Like I'm trying to capture Carol Dweck's research, right. a growth mindset where you're, when you adopt a mindset of I'm always learning and improving. And that's what I view goodish to be. It's not that I'm just accepting my moral failures. It's that I'm, it's quite the opposite. It's, I'm setting a high standard for myself that I'm going to always try to do better and learn from my mistakes. Great. So this allows for mistakes, but also the understanding that you are, one, looking out for the mistakes and trying to stop them before they can actually happen. That's right. I'm owning the impact my mistakes have on others. Right. Right? I'm not trying to protect my own identity. Like, I'm a good person. I don't know why you would think I did that. Right. That's protecting myself. Instead, I'm owning the fact that my behavior did negatively impact someone else. And I'm going to sort of shift my attention from always trying to protect myself and think about what I can do to protect others by getting better. Right. So earlier you talked about the things we have to do in academia with the journal articles and things. So would you say that this book is your most significant work to date or would you give that distinction to some of your other work and why? Yeah, I would say it's my most significant work. I mean, I'm really proud of the other work as well. And in some ways, the other work was harder. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like it didn't come as naturally. Publishing in scholarly journals, I don't think comes as naturally to me. I learned a lot from my co-authors on how to do that as we work on projects. But the book, you know, the book I did not by myself. I had an amazing agent, amazing editor, lots of friends who read drafts and gave me feedback. So it was very much a community effort. But in some ways, I felt like I did have the intuitions on how to do it. Mm -hmm. And so it feels, I guess what makes it feel significant to me is it feels most me of all the work I've done. Right. So I was fortunate to be able to see you give a talk on your book mm -hmm. at one of your Philadelphia events. Yes. And I think it was that event you mentioned how you had your entire outline done, mm. but after you, I guess, did a significant portion of it, you realized it was really individual focus and that you needed to change some things. So could you talk to us a little bit about that process of realizing that even when, when you have a good amount of work done, that you still need to be willing and open to revise that work? Yeah. That great work, mind you. I know. I feel like <laughs> that's a story of my whole life. Honestly, like, you know, two steps forward, one step backward, sometimes one step forward, two steps backward. Yeah. I specifically what happened with the book was I'm trained as a social psychologist, which mm -hmm. means I think about like individuals or I think about individuals and how they're affected by the groups or teams they're part of. Right. But I don't really think about systems, you know, like societal level systems. I mean, I know those words like systemic, but I don't mm -hmm. automatically gravitate towards explanations right. that's in systems. And so this was like a great example of why I felt I learned so much writing the book. I had a table of contents. I had sample chapters. I signed a book contract with a publisher. And all of that was grounded in what I already knew. Mm -hmm. 
And then I started doing like real world interviews to gain examples for the book. And in the real world interviews, people, of course, don't think like, well, I'm only going to speak an individual unit of analysis because I'm trained as a social psychologist. I mean, like that's not (laughs) how normal people think. And so people would just talk about, they would just talk about the various ways in which they were grappling with their own bias or the bias being directed towards them. And sometimes they would talk about systems. They would talk about the educational system or the legal system. And I was just grappling with trying to understand how at first I was just like ignoring it. Like I'd write it down, but it wouldn't make it like when I would sort of transcribe my notes into like, okay, what am I going to use? It wouldn't make it. But then, you know, after the third or fourth time of me just ignoring those, I was like, maybe I should read a little bit. And I actually asked one of the people I was interviewing, you happen to be particularly well informed on these issues. I was like, is there anything you could recommend I read to understand what you're saying better? And he did. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it clicked like, oh man, boy, do I have a blind spot here. Like if I were to wave a magic wand and get rid of everybody's unconscious and conscious bias, let's say I could get rid of like just all of it within individuals' minds. What I realized is we would still have very significant problems and they would set our systems. Right. You mentioned the stories that you've heard from your interviewees and for Everyone who's read the book rereads some so many amazing stories from the interviewees. Are there any stories that particularly stand out for you that really made you go aha or was really moving, perhaps to tears, or you know, any significant story like that that you want to share? Yeah, sure. And there were so many, and there were so many that didn't even make it into the book because right. the base or just, you know, flow. Right. I think the story that for me just has a really special place in my heart is the story of Joe McNeil. Mm -hmm. General Joe McNeil is not a household name, but if I showed you a picture of the Greensboro four on February 1st, 1960, sitting at a segregated lunch counter, it would be familiar to many people who've taken U S history or, or sort of, you know, kept up with the images of the civil rights movement in the sixties, these four college freshmen, decided they were going to, in a peaceful way, sit down at a segregated lunch counter and ask to be served. They knew they would not be because they were Black. Mm -hmm. They were going to just keep coming back day after day and bringing friends with them. And that led to what is now known as the lunch counter sit-ins across the United States. And Joe was one of those uh, four college freshmen. He was one of the two that sort of was the leader of that movement back in 1960. And He is, I saw a program on TV, which featured him and the rest of the Greensboro Four and learned that he lives three miles from me Mm. here in New York state. And I took a chance and like cold called him and just asked if he would be willing to come speak to my students. And this was a number of years ago. And in the years that have passed, he's actually come and spoken a number of times to my students. He's been so generous and gracious. And we become friends and and his wife and my husband, we sort of have these regular double dates now and he's a wonderful human being. And the story he told me that still moves me to tears, like even now thinking about it is I'm actually sort of a little bit of a player in the story, not in a positive way, but the first time he came to speak to my students and he was really moving and humble and inspiring. And like, we were really just blown away by him and his relatability. And we got to the Q&A and I think it was like the last question where I was about to, all right, one last question. And a student said very respectfully, you know, General Neil, thank you so much for your courage. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you so much for your time. Sir, what are your views on gay rights? Mm. And, oh God, like I, I cringe just for even remembering this moment because we like Joe stumbled in his response. Right. He really did. And, and I was like, yeah, we're out of time. Let's wrap this <laughs> up. And it, it was the first, you know, I didn't know him then well at all. And I didn't say anything. And I invited him back the next year. And what was striking to me the next year when he came back was in his remarks where he told a lot of the same stories, as you can imagine, like same little funny dad jokes and stuff. But But in his remarks, there was this new piece where he shared that he realized there was some old fashioned ideas he was trying to work on in his own mind and that that takes work. And he talked about paying attention to news stories about gay rights that he, you know, previously would kind of tune out or 
he was talking to some of his younger relatives and his grandchildren, asking them questions to understand the world they knew as opposed to the world he grew up in. And he really realized he had work to do. I was so struck by this, but I still didn't know him well. And I didn't feel comfortable asking about that until years later when I interviewed him for the book. And when I interviewed him for the book and I said, Joe, do you remember that first time and that second time you came to speak to my students? And I didn't even have to finish. Like, I didn't, I didn't know if it was going to be the salient memory for him. So I was all ready to like give him all the reminders. Um, and he's like, no, oh God. Like he cut me off. He's like, I, yes, I remember that so well. And I was like, oh, wow. So tell me, what do you remember? And what happened between year one and year two? And he basically said, this work of being a good person is really hard. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa. I mean, this is Joe McNeil. He's iconic. He's There's like entire exhibits in museums about him. There's entire museums about him. In fact, you know, right. how, and he's in his seventies and God bless him. He has health issues. Like he's still trying to get better. Like he's trying to be goodish. I mean, he doesn't use that vocabulary, right. but like, that's what he's saying. I was just so taken aback that like, if he's not sitting on his laurels, like, and if he's going to keep working at it, I felt like, gosh, I can keep working on my constant missteps. Right, right. I thank you for sharing that story. I think that was one of the stories that I was fortunate to hear in one of your public talks as well. And it was moving to me when I heard it then as well as moving mm. now when I rehear it. Speaking about systems again, you and I are both privileged to work in academia, mm -hmm. in which most people would agree that as an institution, you know, universities are relatively more liberal than many yeah. other institutions in America. Mm -hmm. Yet we still see an alarming amount of discrimination and equity in academia. So particularly you, actually, you and some co-authors wrote a study about the inequity in academia. Right. But as someone who wrote a book on a topic, what does that say for us in academia and for the type? of hope and optimism we should realistically have for, you know, the other so-called less liberal leaning institutions we have in America. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because when I was writing the book, my editor at HarperCollins, you know, asked me, who's your audience? Is it liberals? Mm -hmm. Is it conservatives? And I was like, well, it's not a political book. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think it should be limited to either one. And I don't think that's even a relevant question. And she's mm -hmm. like, yeah, but you know, it kind of is because that's how marketing works. So she's like, so if, who is it? And I said, honestly, if you make me pick, I pick liberals mm -hmm. because I'm not sure that liberals are any that we're and you know, and I identify as a liberal and right. I'm not sure we're any, how do I say this? Like we, I think have plenty of work to do ourselves and that's a potential blind spot we have where we, we assume conservatives are a certain way and that they're all that way, which is mm -hmm. in and of itself a stereotype. And that we somehow are free from all those unconscious biases. We're not beneficiaries of all those systemic biases. And then I, I actually think we're doing our own share of harm if we fall into that trap. So mm -hmm. I guess I, I'm sort of like reframing your question. I'm just as worried about the liberal amongst us. Okay. Considering today's topic and the purpose of the show, a lot of people have questions about diversity. So a listener wanted to know and basically asked, diversity can be represented as age, gender, sexual orientation, or race in the workplace. So in your opinion, which area is most prevalent today and how has your research addressed it? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are so many dimensions. The ones the, the thoughtful submitter of that question included, as well as religion and body type and gender identity. And there's so many. Right. Well, I think in the United States, particularly, I feel like race has a very specific history mm -hmm. that is largely silenced in organizational life and in the business world. Speak on it, Dolly. Speak on it. <laughs> you know, I've noticed, like, for example, when I give talks in companies, they're usually a lot more comfortable, like if there's like a prep call beforehand, or if we're going to do a fireside chat or something like that, they're usually a lot more comfortable directing the conversation towards the topic of gender right? than towards the topic of race. And so I don't know that, I guess it's not the same as saying it's more prevalent race. I don't know how to measure prevalence exactly, but I do think it's probably the most under discussed. Mm-hmm. 
topic in the workplace right now. And in terms of how my research has addressed it, I don't think I've specifically, I've addressed race for sure in a number of studies, including the one which you were just alluding to, which is with Katie Milkman and Madhu Bakanola, where we looked at when a professor gets a cold call email from a prospective PhD student, how do they respond or do they respond to that cold call email? And we did find that if you were Black or Hispanic or Chinese or Indian, based off of how your name sounded to the recipient of the email, you were less likely to get a response to your email from a cold call. So in some ways, I've certainly addressed it in that it's a variable I study. But I think what I'm actually hoping in my, my next book to talk a bit more about is the specific history of race and the ways in which we've sanitize that history is mm-hmm. sometimes it, in our own minds, but sometimes again in systems, like the way we learned the history was sanitized so that it makes it hard for us to even realize the role race is playing right. in our organizational life. We don't know how we got the disparities, for example, of the racial disparities we see in senior leadership, leadership of companies. We sort of just think is that way, as opposed Mm -hmm. to it came from, it is the product of choices and decisions and design of systems. And that if we don't know that, then we will just assume, well, I guess that's who leads companies is white men, right? as opposed to we built companies so that white men could lead them. And now if we want that to change, we're going to have to change how companies operate. Right. So most of my research has been on a U.S. focus as well, but if you could just take a moment, could you think from an international perspective, what would be some of your responses in terms of what's typically been studied in terms of diversity from an international perspective and any thoughts that you have on some of that research? Absolutely. Yeah. I, maybe I should have prefaced my last answer to say, I think what I study is the psychology of these things as opposed to like any specific bias. Mm-hmm. And so like my book is actually surprising to me because I thought it kind of had a U.S. focus in the examples, but the psychology of it does have a more universal applicability. And it, in the book, I talk about all sorts of biases. We talk about gender, we talk about race, we talk about sexual orientation, we talk about right. gender identity. We talk about a lot of different biases. And the reason is, it's not meant to just be like, just, you know, throw it all in the pot. It's meant to say, well, there's there are some psychological processes that are relevant to all of these. And I think that's what I see as well internationally is that there are some processes that are relevant, whether you're in India or Australia or Ghana, Mm -hmm. that would be relevant. That isn't to say that there aren't cross-cultural phenomena at work as well that I'm not deeply fluent in, but I've been surprised to, you know, get emails from emails or, or reviews online of the book. I have a TED talk that's related to the book and the TED Talk, as you know, TED Talks sort of just, that's like its own global right. phenomena. Comments in the views are definitely coming from all over the world. So I think there is something relatable and universal about this good versus goodish phenomena that can speak to if you're in India and it's about religious bias, or if you're in China and it's about biases having to do relationships between China and Japan historically, like all of those right culturally bound biases, I think, can fall under this bigger psychological umbrella. Absolutely. I agree as well. So listener Leslie Tyler would like to know, what advice can you give people who are the only one in an organization and who often feel invisible or misunderstood? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, so glad Leslie is is naming that. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that is actually the first piece of advice I would give is to to not internalize what it must feel like at times in those roles, because you could internalize a feeling of somehow, you know, being the only one means I don't belong or I, because I don't match the prototype, that means I don't meet the standard. That could easily happen. It does happen. The research says that kind of thing happens, but you want to actively fight against it and name it. I think in terms of advice, I would look for who are the people within the organization who you feel have the potential to understand what you have to offer, to advocate for you? There's a wonderful talk on YouTube by Carla Harris. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the exact title of it, but if you look under Carla's Pearls, I think is how she she titles them, like pearls like you would wear around your neck because she, right. she that's like your trademark that she's always wearing pearls. Carla Harris, Carla's Pearls. She has a wonderful little five minute 
video clip that I use when I teach where she talks about sponsors versus mentors. And I think one of the things when you're the only one in an organization, you want to start looking for who those sponsors are going to be. People who, she says, when you're not in the room are arguing on your behalf, are sort of opening doors for you. Not everybody's going to be that person. It isn't as simple as just asking someone to be that. Like that, that's not how it works. It's a matter of looking for opportunities to learn from them, to ask advice, to get feedback, to put your hand up and say, I'm looking for opportunities. I have a friend who is, a, she's female in a very, very male dominated field. And she once early in her career went into her boss's office and she said, the answer is yes. And he was like, what? Like, what, what was the question? <laughs> and she's like, it doesn't matter. The answer is yes. If you want me to like take on the tough client, the answer is yes. If you want me to, you know, go for three months in London and like get things fixed up in the London office, the answer is yes. And her point was, you may not be thinking of me for these opportunities. So I want to get ahead of you and just tell you, I want the opportunities. I can do it. I'm ready for it. Right. Even if you don't believe you're ready for it, uh, Leslie, you are. Just mm -hmm. say yes. Right. So this is a related question, but use some more formal language that we use a lot in the field. How would you recommend people confront microaggressions when they are in positions of unequal or lesser power? Yeah. Well, so that's, that's such an individual question. Mm -hmm. First, it's not your job to do it. So you shouldn't feel mm -hmm. you have to, is I think the first thing. I think there's this sort of double whammy that comes with when you're on the receiving end of a microaggression. So already whammy number one, receiving end of microaggression. And then whammy number two is like somehow now you're responsible for like educating that person or confronting them. Like that's like whammy number two now. And so- mm -hmm. The first thing is to say, whammy number two is a choice, I believe, that everyone shouldn't feel they have to take that on. There may be times in your life where you feel more capacity and responsibility to do that. And there may be other times in your life where you just need to take care of you and figure out how to build the armor you need around the microaggression to withstand it, but, you know, mm -hmm. not go fix so and so. But if you do want to take on whammy number two, if that is where your energy is, or if you're in a position where you have no choice but to do so, I think it's good to develop a couple of little tools you can rely on. I have my students practice these in class, like literally sit around trying, saying things. We, we use like made up right. categories, like circles or squares, like somebody saying something sort of microaggression about circles. What are you going to say in response? And we try different responses. Like one of my favorite responses when you can't think of anything to say is to just say, ouch, somebody makes some totally inappropriate joke mm -hmm. or borderline inappropriate, which is even harder to deal with because it's not totally inappropriate. Right. And rather than coming up with this witty response or the three paragraph explanation that un breaks down all the layers of why that was borderline inappropriate, you could just go, ouch, and let them do the work to figure out why you just said, ouch, you know, right. it deflates the norm in that moment of like, that's okay. What just happened? Ouch. Yikes. You know, somebody touches your hair. Yikes. Like it just sort of like stops the action a little bit. That's just one possible way to respond. But I do think it's good to figure out in advance, not in the moment. In the moment, I don't know. I can't think of anything clever in the moment. But in advance, a couple of uh, go-to phrases. Um, one of my favorite go-to phrases is I'll say something like, oh, my God, you don't look old enough to have such old-fashioned ideas. <laughs> so it's it's uh, it's a backhanded compliment, right? You know, right. <laughs> Right. I would look for your phrases. Phrases aren't going to change the world, but it does put the responsibility back on the other person. Right. I love that advice, but I want people to really hear that your advice basically states you have to practice this when you're not in the moment. Yeah. So that when you find yourself in the moment, you can have those phrases, you know, those go-to devices to help you deal with these situations. When I do my trainings, I use situational judgment tests to put people like in simulations. You need to walk through this now mm. so that you can be ready 
when the situation actually occurs. Oh, nice. That sounds outstanding. So I love that advice. Yeah, that's great, Oscar. So Anita Nadal wants to know, do you think that the increased use of militarization against immigrants by the current administration has impacted Americans' views of diversity, particularly with respect to people of color in the U.S.? You know, it's, I suspect yes. I haven't seen data on that, but my gut says it's probably created two effects in opposite directions. Like Mm -hmm. the increased militarization, I think has a real dehumanizing component to it. I think on the one hand, it sort of maybe is creating this like sense of diversity is the problem somehow, Mm -hmm. as opposed to the opportunity and that the systems are the problem and the bias is the problem. But so on the one hand, I think maybe it's created a more negative view of diversity. On the other hand, I think there's, particularly amongst people who I think have already sort of, or for whatever reason, they do have an individualistic view of people who are different than them. So they've maybe, based on people they know in their lives, for example, like they're able to see a person of color, even if they can't relate to that person of color's life experiences, they're able to sort of stay connected to the fact that this is a person who, you know, sometimes has like sore shoulders after staring at their computer too long or needs to remember Mm -hmm. to get a Mother's Day card or is worried about whether they're spending enough time with their child. Like these are like really human concerns of a human being. And I think if you're viewing people different than you in that kind of way, then the militarization must feel like an affront to values around diversity that you believe in. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it might be going in two directions. Right. So this is not where Anita was going, but as I think of the militarization, if we just juxtapose some of the protests that we've seen, say with Black Lives Matter versus some of the recent protests, the COVID-19 protests, and just the different responses from, again, thinking system-wide different responses from the state. Yeah. It's really unbelievable to me to see the difference. Not that it's surprising to any of us, right? Because we kind of understand this, but to see it, it still hurts, right? It really hurts to see. It's so stark. I mean, it's just so, like on the one hand, it's so stark. It's like sometimes when you sort of feel like you're, you're talking yourself blue in the face, trying to explain things to people who might not see that these inequities exist it's like well there you go i now i can put literally the two pictures next to each other right and how much clearer can it be but it's also so stark that it's like oh i guess a whole bunch of people are okay with this because it's so stark and you're not upset yeah so dr jason rivera wants to know oftentimes people conflate diversity and equity conversations. Mm -hmm. So how would you help someone think about the distinctions between the two and move from a superficial conversation about diversity to a more equity-minded lens? How do you help people move beyond conversations about diversity that just perpetuate this Black-white paradigm so that they are more inclusive? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I mean, there's some great metaphors out there that I I wasn't clever enough to coin, but I do (laughs) do like using them. And I'm not even sure who to credit, but, you know, the idea of, like, there's a difference between being allowed to go to the dance and being asked to dance. And uh-huh. there's a difference, you know, diversity is counting the numbers and inclusion is making the numbers count. Mm-hmm. I do find those distinctions, those are more diversity versus inclusion than diversity versus equity specifically. Mm-hmm. I think this goes back a little bit to systems. You know, I, I feel like the equity question right. is the hardest one to get our heads around, because if you're in the United States, your whole life heard about equal opportunity, opportunity for all, whatever. And we've interpreted that as meaning, well, everyone has an equal opportunity to apply to college. So why isn't everybody applying to college? You know, why isn't everyone going to college? And it doesn't unpack all the underlying variables. You know, it, it makes me think about, you know, maybe what I would say to Dr. Rivera is like, it makes me think about when we were kids, we used to have those, they call them spy pens. You could seem like you were writing, but nothing would come out of the pen. Right. Yeah. I remember those. You remember those? And then you would have like this little light on the other end of the pen where the eraser usually is. And you press the button on the light and this blue light comes out, this ultraviolet light or something. 
and it reveals the spy ink that you were writing with all along so you can see what you were writing and in some ways i think that's what's happening is like you think oh well everybody can apply to college so i guess we have equity isn't that what equity is but we don't realize that there's all these variables that contribute to whether or not you can and do apply to college and what you can and do go to college and can and do finish college and can and do pay for college right. that are not easily seen. Like they're there though. That ink is there on the paper. And unless you're looking for it with that little light, or unless you have some personal experience, like you were the one writing, so you knew what you wrote, you're not going to realize that it matters whether you know that there's application deadlines. It matters whether you know that the financial aid deadline is not the same. It matters whether you know that you're going to see a campus is a thing you do before you apply, not after. Like my family didn't know that. And my, my parents are college educated, but not in this country. And we didn't realize that people go visit colleges before you get into them. Right. Like, why would you do that? Wait till you get in. Like, so we, we waited till afterwards to go visit. You know, now in hindsight, I'm like, oh, wow, I guess everybody else was visiting before. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So it's just a lot of unspoken tacit stuff as well. So I think that's, you know, a long-winded, not super punchy response to Dr. Rivera of saying that I think a lot of it's about going beyond just what meets the eye. Mm -hmm. I think, and I know Dr. Rivera personally, so I definitely understand where he was coming from the Black-White paradigm, which I, I really do think, particularly from a U.S. perspective, is an important paradigm that we don't do enough, as you alluded to before, in terms of the conversation about race. But I think he was wanting to also hear um, info about moving to, say, you know, Latinx people, Asian Americans, Indians, things like that as well. Oh, beautiful. To really speak to the sometimes same experiences, but also different experiences that those groups uh, might have as well. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I very much on a personal level relate to that because I'm neither black nor right. white and right. often sort of feel lost in that paradigm myself. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I think one of the things that I'm noticing recently is that a lot of us who are not black and not white have internalized that paradigm. Like I think I'm mm -hmm. speaking for myself a little bit here and I don't know if there's research on this or not, but we ourselves have without realizing it kind of just lost track of our own identities and how they fit in and in ways in which we sometimes benefit from being seen as not whatever black or not white. Not black, right. Yeah. Yeah. But also, I think I also benefit from being seen as not white. Mm -hmm, right. I think Black people sometimes give me the benefit of the doubt and that I may or may not have earned, quite frankly. So yeah, I don't. I think that's a great question. I'm not sure I myself have moved past that paradigm yet. Gotcha, gotcha. I know you and I both have worked with a number of clients, you know, in various capacities, helping them with the EI efforts. But due to COVID-19, obviously that type of work has slowed down quite a bit, or at least it has for me. And I imagine it has for you as well. Mm -hmm. So first, how do you think organizations are dealing with their DEI efforts in the midst of this pandemic? And second, what should organizations do, particularly now with respect to their DEI efforts? Yeah. Well, I think they should hire you. <laughs> they should do. I really do. I think it's so wonderful that you're out there. I have to confess that I don't do as much work as I probably could in that space. I mean, pre-COVID, that is in the sense that I... I just haven't sort of figured out how to balance my life and the hours right. of the day. So I've decided to sort of spend more of that time on book writing than on actually working in organizations. So I give some talks and things like that. But yes, I absolutely agree. I think I was getting at least one speaking invitation a day mm -hmm. before March, and that's not, no longer true. I think that organizations right now, everyone is just the house is on fire mm -hmm. and, you know, they don't have the bandwidth to figure out how to, I can't come up with a good closing to that metaphor that brings in right. DEI, but there is one in there somewhere that somebody's, put. maybe they, they can send it our way, but we're just trying to put the fire out and figure out where the fire started and mm -hmm. why it keeps burning. But the DEI work is going to come back for sure. It's if anything, I think when it comes back, the massive disparities that are revealing themselves to some to some people who didn't realize they were there in terms of access to healthcare, in terms of 
underlying health conditions and how they relate to where people live and sort of how they're treated by the medical profession and right. whether or not they have access to insurance and whether or not they are paid a living wage. Like all those questions are being discussed now far more in the mainstream media. I think they were discussed before, but maybe being noticed by far more people in the mainstream media right now. So I feel like when the fire is under control, there is going to be more attention on these issues. Right. The question is, will there be budget? And, you know, I'm hearing a lot about companies moving mm -hmm. training efforts online, both for health reasons and for financial reasons. But then that also raises the question of was training the right approach to begin with mm -hmm. on DEI? Like is an approach, it's certainly critical, but is it, does it really solve our problems or do we need right. to be looking again at systems, how we hire, how we reward, things like that? I absolutely agree. And this goes back to the equity concerns. Considering if we look at DEI efforts and if you as a company invested pre-COVID, right, a significant amount mm -hmm. of financial investments into your DEI efforts, then typically the people from underrepresented groups may have joined your company yeah. later than other groups of people. Well, now companies are laying off people. Yes. So will these people who you invest a huge amounts to boost your DEI efforts be the first people to get laid off? And is that equitable? Right. You know, when you look at systems of advantage and disadvantage. So I think these are hard questions that companies really need to not only address, but they probably need help addressing as well. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. I think that's such a great way to frame what someone like you can offer with your expertise to sort of help make that visible before a company makes a really grave mistake that they regret. Right. And I will say not only hard conversations, but these could be uncomfortable conversations as well mm -hmm. that people can have in organizations. So you alluded to it earlier, but I would just want to formally ask you, what future projects do you have in the works and what are some things that we should be on the lookout for from you? Oh, thank you. Well, I am writing another book. Yay. Uh, yay. <laughs> another book that I wish I had written. <laughs> oh, God, well, listen, your book's going to be all you. Yeah. I cannot wait. I know that that's that time will come if you want it to come. Yeah, yeah. I think it's on my goal list as well. So. Yeah, well, you're a young man. So. We shall see how long it takes, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just keep writing down notes as you go. Right. Well, I'm, I'm really interested in, this came largely out of, there's a chapter, well, actually, this is funny, it relates back to the question you asked earlier about when I had to change the outline of the book and include systems, mm -hmm. when I realized what a blind spot I had about that. Well, one of the systems that I end up talking about in the book as an example is how we learn U.S. history. And mm -hmm. if you go to high school in the United States, Middle school, high school usually learn about the GI Bill, which was legislation mm -hmm. after World War II to help veterans go to college and buy homes. And we often talk about the rise of the middle class, the rise of suburbia that led to this you know, huge increase in the percentage of people who were college educated and homeowners. But what most of us don't know and didn't learn is that, and this is based on my informal polling, what I, I don't think most of us learned, is that the GI Bill was really written in a way that made it accessible for white veterans, but not black veterans. Mm -hmm. And so I was really like blown away when I learned that. And when I tried to interview people for that chapter in the book, it was interesting that that was the one chapter where people I interviewed asked to be anonymous Okay, when they were reflecting, you know, on their own, let's say a white person reflecting on their father or grandfather who was in world war two and went to college on the GI bill. Like there was something in confronting the past, even though it wasn't their fault per se, but they somehow benefited from this reality where blacks are being excluded. Mm -hmm. And it really got me thinking about like, how do we, how do we look at the past? How do we confront the past? Well, even if it wasn't our fault, why are we like, why is it so hard to look at that? Why don't we learn this in U.S. history that the GI Bill, I mean, maybe kids today do, but I don't think mm -hmm. my generation did. Like, why weren't we told that? Like, why don't we just, why aren't we told the truth? And it leads to, you know, all sorts of emotional and psychological things that like right now, if you tell me the truth, which is I am standing on stolen land, you know, my mm -hmm. home is built off of 
land that belonged to Native Americans. Right. It was never supposed to be mine. How do I hold that thought with the same thought of I'm I'm in a home my husband and I worked really hard to pay for? And, you know, that's our first home and where we're raising our children and we feel pride in that. And like, how do I hold those two thoughts together in my mind and paradox? So my next book is about how do we confront the past, even when or especially when the past is hard to confront. Intellectually, I think we all know it's useful to do that, to learn that history. But emotionally and psychologically, I'd like more tools on how to do it. And I think I think it's out there in the social sciences that I can sort of put together in book form. Well, I know I will speak for everyone. We can't wait until that book is published as well. Thank you. So thank you, Dolly, so much for the gift of your research and your book and teaching and for sharing with us some great advice on how all of us can do more to eliminate bias and discrimination. So I wish you continued success in all of your future endeavors. Oh, Oscar, thank you. And thank you for bringing your brilliance to all of us through all of your work, your scholarship, your teaching, your now a podcast, your consulting, your speaking. It really, our field of academia doesn't often make that easy to do. And I love your conviction and your commitment to bringing your gifts to the world. And we need you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Diversity Matters. If you enjoyed our show and want to hear more, please subscribe to our show, post, talk about, and reshare our show with all of your friends and family. And leave us a favorable rating and review so that it will make it easier for others to find us wherever they listen to podcasts. We cannot do this important work or keep it going without you, so we really appreciate your support. We especially like to thank our episode sponsor, Front Runner New Jersey, a media outlet that brings a fresh new perspective on the people, events, and issues making an impact on African-Americans in South Jersey and the nation. For more information, please visit their website at www.frontrunnernewjersey.com. If you or your company would like to sponsor a Diversity Matters episode, please visit the podcast section of our website at www.whconsultingfirm.com for more information. Diversity Matters is produced by WH Consulting, a firm that provides a wide range of management consulting and professional services to individuals and organizations. Original music produced by Sincere Morton Murray. Until next time, peace and love.